Oh, oh, Hey everybody, welcome to the Patty G Show. I'm your host, Patty G. We are here with the Bush Brothers. Yeah. Um, I'm excited to hear about their story. It's already, we've got twice as many guests as we normally do, three times as many guests as we normally do, so it's going to be a lot of fun. We're going to be able to go back and forth a lot and hearing about Horizon as a whole and what they do in their everyday life and talking about some broader aspects of planning your life from a financial standpoint, but also I want to get in with them, the marketing element of the importance of audio and video and how you incorporate that in your entire marketing plan as a company and the benefits that you can see from that. And so before we get started, a big shout out. We are recording here in Falaya Focus Studio as we do every week. And thank you to our wonderful sponsors making this possible, Government Taco. And these guys, <laughs> these guys are our recent sponsor picked up. If you listened last week, you know about them. And you're now going to hear their story of how they came to be. So without further ado, the Bush Brothers, I'll let y'all go around and introduce yourselves so people listening can get to know your voice and people watching can get to know your face. Well, let's start with the oldest and best looking. <laughs> uh, Bill Bush here. Uh, I'm actually the second of six. Of, there's six of us. Wait, five, there's six? Five boys six and one now. girl. I'm the, the number two son, so I'm the second oldest. So Bill, and then there's Brother Pete. I'm Brother Pete. I'm the third of six, um, safely hiding out in the middle, you yeah. know, and uh, yeah, been out a while. And I'm the last of the bushes. The baby. I'm the youngest. You're the baby? I'm the baby. Are and you the baby overall or just the baby brother? <laughs> I'm the baby. Overall. The baby overall. All right. See, I'm the baby boy oh, out, of, okay. out of five. So I'm fourth out of five. Doesn't, okay. doesn't he look like a, little a cute sister. little baby? Yeah. Right. He's so cuddly. <laughs> and, our voices, and our voices are all the same. <laughs> yeah. So when you say get to know our voice, voices, we all sound yeah, the same. The yeah. voices are the same. The faces well, are well, well, your brother, so it's all headshots. similar. Yeah, yeah, the headshots in the promo were like, did they just use the same headshot yeah, that's right. three times? It's yeah. a morphine. That's what I, wa I walked in and Jacob told me, he's like, Patty, like, this is they all look exactly <laughs> the same. The DNA is very strong. DNA. <laughs> right. yeah. if, if we can figure out a way to... Add in as y'all each speak who it is, <laughs> yeah, you, know, yeah. you know, throw it in there. So what is Horizon? Well, Horizon is a financial planning wealth management firm. Uh, we've been, been at it quite a long time. It has existed now for 22 years, um, but for the first eight years of my career is with another firm and then broke off in late 99 and started what is now Horizon. So uh, we help people uh, with all sorts of things, but in general, help them become more confident with their uh, with their finances, with their financial management. So were all three of y'all in the financial management field prior to the opening of Horizon, or how did that how did that origin get there? I know you opened it in, yeah. in 99, but specifically, how did the three of you decide to work together? Yeah, you want to tackle that? Yeah, I, I'll tackle part. Part, your part. part my part. Uh, well, I've known these guys all my life. <laughs> I'll start there. Um, no, uh, so so interestingly enough, the the company that Pete worked with prior to uh, Horizon, I had joined about six months Before. prior to, yeah. <laughs> to him leaving. Yeah. So in '99, about mid '99, uh, I joined just as a uh, you know my my role for that guy was uh, at the that advisor at the time was kind of a a little bit of a, a, a computer tech guy. I mean, I'm, I'm really not that much of a tech guy, but I knew a little bit about it. And then as, as uh, time went on, I ended up uh, joining back with Pete, getting a uh, securities license. So I got a securities license in 2000. Bill, on the other hand, yeah, yeah has a story. I'm actually uh, on my third career. So about never too late to change. Yeah. About yeah. eight exactly. years ago, these guys came to me and said, Hey, we're really building something special down here in Baton Rouge. So we kind of grew up here. I was up in Alexandria. I was a uh, administrator of a couple of post acute care hospitals and they said, Hey, we want you to be a part of this. We think, you know, I had a marketing background and some broadcasting background before the hospital thing. And they said, you know, we think, uh, you'd be great in the business and using your skills to kind of push it and, and advance it further. So about six and a half years ago, I, I joined the firm, moved the family down from Alexandria back home and got licensed and now I'm one of them. Yeah, yep. the family business. So when everybody always says, uh, you know, how's it, how's it uh, being in business with your family? 
you know, normally you get a mixed bag on that, but right. you know, you probably have already figured it out. We uh we all get along really well and we have a great time together. <laughs> yeah. And I we, s- we broke enough drywall when we were younger. <laughs> yeah, we, we got it all out of the way. Right, 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 right. Most most of it. <laughs> most, most most of it. it the, the pecking order was already established prior to <laughs> yeah. the beginning well, yeah. of the business. Right, right, yeah, right. Yeah. yeah, it's interesting though because when Bill was coming on board, we had consulted with him on a couple of creative mm-hmm. projects when he was still back in uh, Alexandria and he uh he has that background as a sportscaster and a lot of uh, uh familiarity with filming and audio and all that stuff and we were we we're actually uh filming uh somewhat of a little commercial or whatever <laughs> I was like man we got to go to Bill he's very creative <laughs> you know and yeah. and so we did a couple things like that and then it just evolved it was like man you know uh the things had really started moving digital, you know, so I know you want to talk about podcasting and marketing and things like that. And I was like, well, you know, it, neither one of us are experts on that. And, you know, I think Bill would tell you, he's probably not an expert on that, but he, right. but he's a quick study and he, and it's his thing, you know, so very creative mind and has added that element to what is traditionally thought of as, you know, old stodgy, boring, financial, analytical, you know, so bringing some of that creativity into, a wealth management firm is a differentiator. Mm-hmm. Right. So, so Bill, you had a sportscaster or broadcaster yeah, background? Yeah, graduated uh, broadcast journalism from LSU, minored in business administration, so took some finance classes, economics, those kind of things. I actually used to work with Jacques Doucet. He was my mm-hmm. weekend guy okay. when He's I did understudy. sports. Yeah. yeah. So I worked in Lafayette and Alexandria as a sportscaster and uh, kind of gave that up, got in the marketing world, and then the hospital marketing and then administration from there. So, yeah. And then went and studied for all the finance oh, courses. Yeah. fun <laughs> stuff. And, Back you know, to school. I was mm. on the verge of turning 50. I was almost 50 when I, you know, came down here and, and joined them. So, yeah, back to school for pretty much uh, months on end just learning it, you know. Wow, and that in and of itself, making a big career change at what some people would see as the latter part of your life or your yeah. career is – ultimately a tough decision to make right no for sure i mean but it's kind of like one of those things you know uh you, nothing ventured nothing gained and you know you're you, the cliff is there it looks pretty enticing why not jump you know that's <laughs> that's a fact as you can see the stress has made him lose some of his hair <laughs> <laughs> i still have a couple charlie brown pieces there. <laughs> well, I, he, he he talks but as the youngest right, he's, got right, the, right, he's got the the well, so bald yeah, and here. Andy and I get accused a lot. We we work a, a lot closely in the 401k division of Horizon, so we are the advisors on about 75 company retirement plans. And so when we go out and service those plans, a lot of people, you know, think we're twins. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And a lot so, of people yeah. think <laughs> when we tell them we're just brothers and not twins, they think he's the oldest brother, which yeah, I kind is. of enjoy. We do enjoy that. Yeah. It's such a shame. Yeah. Is it though? I mean, yeah. is it a shame? Because I, I get, I don't know what it is about the younger brothers, but I get the same thing with my older uh, brothers. Yeah. You know, that the, we'll be going in public and they'll be like, oh, yeah, he's the oldest brother. And they all look at me like, what are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> he's, well, he's got like I'm five years older than uh, him. What right. are you talking about? Yeah, right. What we tell everybody that, you know, new people that come in or people that inquire about coming to work at our firm or whatever, you know, I always tell them and may, they may be young and have a full set of hair like you and no DNA relationship to the Bush brothers. No. But I always joke with them and tell them, hey, man, this industry's tough. And I can tell you, in a couple of years, you're going to look just like this. <laughs> <laughs> the, the hair moves from the head to the, to the face. Exactly. That's right. It yeah. won't take long. Grow where you stressful. can, you know? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> so making the leap to leave the firm that you're at, what kind of went through your thought process of doing that? I mean, not everybody yeah. decides when they're working for someone, I'm going to leave. I think I can do this better. Right. You know, it takes a different mentality to recognize opportunity within that realm yeah you you mature you know you you come in as a young person right out of school or what have you and you you're a complete uh you know blank slate right so you're learning kind of as you go uh forming your belief system up and you're so you're experiencing what you know what you're experiencing in that firm but you're also starting to pay attention to how other people do it you're reading about the industry you're taking in information as you grow as a professional and I think that's where the road started to diverge a little bit. I'm like, you know, I'm I'm kind of more interested in this type of firm. I'm more interested in, you know, maybe attracting these types of clients. And it just did, it, it, you get out of alignment. And so it wasn't about going and doing something better. It was really going about doing something different. And, and that was, you know, it took a lot of courage. It took, you know, uh, financial risk, 
you know, going out. I mean, I always say we, we left and, and, uh, signed a note on a building and, you know, started our own business. You know, my, my son was, uh, my wife was due with my son like a few months later. So, you know, you got a growing family. That's an even bolder. Man. Yeah. It's a lot, I mean, it's a lot of pressure, but, uh, that just told you that, you know, it, Bill said it earlier. I mean, you know, fortune favors the bold, right? You have to, you have to commit, put your stake in the ground. And once you do, it's sort of like things start to unfold in your favor, right? That wouldn't have ever, you would have never seen them. You could have never counted on them, but it's like just by making that bold step, you, the universe starts to move you right. know, as well. So that, that's really what it was. It was about coming into the industry, uh, more as a, you know, inexperienced rookie and then developing some thoughts about, you know, one day I want to be, have my own thing. Yeah. And then I think, Nowadays, that if you would have approached your employer, I think they would have found a way to expand their existing reach and their yeah. existing product line. Because in today's workflow, you can't afford to have employees just walk off right. and start their yeah. own business. Right. I mean, we've seen over the last two years that the labor shortage is just astronomical. Mm -hmm. yes. yeah. But in part with you saying that the universe just started kind of opening up, a lot of people tend to attribute some success to entrepreneurs as luck. But what I was reading the other day is somebody put it, it's not so much of luck, but it's you looking for those opportunities. Yeah. If you were in your regular quote unquote nine to five job, you're not necessarily looking to go out and reach 78 different people to have 401k plans. Mm -hmm. You know, you may be looking to grow that next customer, that next customer. When you're owning your own business and growing your own practice, your view becomes so <laughs> much wider. No you doubt. start looking everywhere to find opportunities instead of waiting for a lead to come in and sitting there and hoping someone else refers. You're now, I have to grow a business. Yeah. You had a kid coming. Right. There are different <laughs> things that play into it yeah. that now your mindset and your viewpoint is totally changed from that of an employee. No doubt about it. And, you know, the, the old Thomas Jefferson thing, right? You know, I believe in luck. The harder I work, the luckier I get. And, and there's a lot of that that goes into starting a business from scratch, basically from scratch. I mean, I had some clients that followed us, right? Anytime you're dealing in a professional relationship with somebody, I mean, you develop a personal relationship as well. So there was some foundation there to start with, but it was, to, compared to today, it was just extremely small. And you just had to go build, build on top of that. So, you know, finding people, you know, again, there's a lot of trust in this family. And finding people like that that you can lock arms with um, you you got something you can build on, right? I mean, or is it just in reality you kind of felt bad for the middle brother and you're like, ah, oh, we'll go, we'll go help him out. I got any help? <laughs> yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. That's right. So, what was the the conversation like with you to make the switch? Say, hey, come come work with me. Were you already sold when he said I want to do this, or was it some convincing that you were unsure of initially? Yeah, so so I'm probably not as risky of a person as Pete is. Uh, he's a little more uh, bold and, and visionary uh, in in the way he approaches life, uh, whereas I'm probably a little more uh, reserved. But but I was approached by, like I said, his his former uh, advisor uh, boss, I guess you would say, uh, that he was affiliated with, um, and and that that attraction was. I wasn't really going into the the financial uh, advisory world. I was just going to help, right? Yeah. And then I was like, okay, I can do that. When when we talked about, uh, you know, after he left, it was uh, it was okay. Well, this is going to be different, you know, and 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 I'm going to have to just uh, you know roll up my sleeves and strap up my boots and go forward. Right. You're going from doing an instruction to now figuring out what those instructions are. Yeah, and kind of learning along the way from Big Brother, and um, and because uh, he he had uh, I guess ten years almost ahead of me of uh, experience, and so kind of learning <laughs> learning what he did good and what he didn't do what so good, and so yeah. you know that's that's been my life though. You know, is learning from the the examples that these guys set the the good, bad, and ugly. Right, yeah. and and there's a lot to learn. Well, I, I told him at one point when you're we coming over, I was like, I bet we can succeed before the electric bills do. I bet we can find. <laughs> I bet before the rent is due, we right. can find a couple of clients. That's right. right. At yeah, least right. at least one client to pay that electrical Dude, we bill. Can, we we can may can not survive. be able to eat, but yeah. you know that's fine. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. And I, I think that in and of itself is what scares a lot of people away from making that jump, mm -hmm. even in the professional field. You know, you've got your set list of clients, but your clients that you work with closely 
maybe just enough that you can't really bring on a team and still pay their mm, salaries. Yeah, so right. as the owner, you've got to, you know, as financial planners calculate, what can you afford to not make and for how long before you've got to start really looking at stuff. You're constantly yeah. putting bets on the table, and yeah. it, the, some of the bets are on people, you know, and those don't always pan out, right? You do have uh, – uh, you end up at this stage of the game, been at it 30 years now, and you end up with bets that paid off really, really well. For instance, uh, you know, our COO at Horizon has been with us 20 years now. She's in her 21st year, and she started when she was 19. So she turns. She actually turns forty this year, and she's been with us twenty, almost twenty. I don't know years. if you're supposed to say that. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe not. Uh, but but uh, you know that's a that's an example of we weren't even looking for anybody at the time, yeah. and she was still in college, and you know it's like okay, well part time help, whatever, you know we'll figure it out, and then you stumble into you know one of the more amazing workers, you know, people that you've ever come across, and and that's why that one worked out really well but then there's others that you know you take a chance you'd like oh this is gonna be great you know yeah. andy knows this about me they're all yeah. it's just gonna be great <laughs> yeah. this is a perfect person i am uh, he's, he's the pure pure optimist i am, optimist, optimist, yeah. 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 I am I'm a, un, unashamed optimist you know yeah. but I, i'll say this i mean to that point you know the older i get and the more i've experienced and and in life uh you know you get to that point where you're like well let's just do it you know, mm. and the don't think, don't overthink it. I think Jack Welch said he wished that he wouldn't have spent so much time pondering over decisions. You just make them. And then yeah. if it's the wrong one, he'll figure it out pretty quickly and don't be wrong long. Yeah. Yeah. And if it's the right one, then, it, you know, he started early. There's a risk in doing nothing, too. I mean, you know, and that's that's when you asked about leaving that other uh, that other arrangement I was in. It was, it was, there's a cost to leave and I can get my calculator out and I can go, well, I got to sign up the electric bill. I got to get a building. I got to do it. You can easily figure out the cost to leave, but there's a cost to stay in certain situations that you can't calculate and you don't see those until you leave. So just always know there is a cost to stay and it's harder to figure out. Mm. Right, because sometimes it's not always monetary. That's right. Yeah. A lot of times it's mostly not monetary. Yeah, it's yeah. your state lifestyle, of peace of mind. Yeah, yeah. yeah. those kind of things matter for yeah. sure. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And then, you know, it's so much so that you uproot your entire life and change cities. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly. From your wife's hometown. Yeah. Well, that's yeah. Pull that one off. How did that? <laughs> that's courage. What was the dinner <laughs> table <laughs> conversation like? <laughs> Telling well, her we have to leave your hometown. I, I think uh I think, you know, I think just well, I had a small daughter, she was nine when we moved and she was not happy about it. But I think the general thought was there are opportunities out there that we don't, you know, can't don't have here. Bigger city, you know, certainly better opportunities for our daughter. And also career-wise for both of us, you know. Uh, and so it wasn't a, a long conversation, really. It's like, you know, I think we were ready for something like the that. The points were laid out. Really. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And well, we, I mean, th they kind of worked on me over time, you know. It yeah. wasn't just a, hey. A couple of years. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. A couple of years. Yeah. Right. But just that collaborating back and forth on some of those other projects, you know, certainly warmed me up to the possibility of, like, yeah, this could be something, you know. Yeah. Right. Well, and it's especially with family business, you don't necessarily always want to mix business with yeah. family and so having that being on the outside looking in at the family business is one thing you know i'm i'm in that situation mm -hmm. right now with my family's business they're mm -hmm. running it my brothers are in it my parents are in it yeah and i'm from that outside looking in and it's you're able to see okay they're building something that's great but at what point do you actually jump in with them mm -hmm. you know and it's a nervous moment because you don't know what's going to happen to the relationships at work, at home, at Thanksgiving, what is it going to turn into? Yeah, you know, are you going to come in one day, have a bad morning, and then now you're making your entire day worse with your brothers? Yeah, or exactly. is it a relationship there that they can maybe fix it? Right, yeah. you know, yeah. it's a dance you got to figure out. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. for sure, and that is why they made bourbon. <laughs> <laughs> and we get that honest. <laughs> that's, that's that's right. Look, hey, sometimes at the end of the day, look, tax seasons. We're in the heat of tax season yeah, right that's now right. for us, yeah. and you know, bourbon, many fridges next to the desk after yeah. four thirty, five yeah. o'clock. If you're still at yeah. the office, 
you have those people call you and say, how creative can we get this year? Yeah. And say, well, I'm only uh, one glass in, not that creative. Yeah, Sorry. Right, right. Right. Call me in an that's hour. Awesome. That's right. Call yeah. me an hour. Well, we, we were born in bourbon land. So yeah. That's yeah. right. We were born in Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, moved across the river in Indiana, so we grew up around all that uh, that world and yeah. you know tobacco and bourbon, tobacco yeah, and bourbon. So how did y'all end up here? Our our dad changed jobs back in the late 70s, 79. 79. Yep. Um, if you, I mean, the economy was terrible then. It was if you look mm -hmm. back, it was yeah. uh, you know a terrible time in the economy, and and so, we lived on a farm. Lived on a farm. My mom has relatives in Alexandria, yeah. so we came down to visit them and. While we were on that trip, Dad kind of came on down to Baton Rouge and Geismer, and he was job interview. Yeah, he was in the chemical industry, you know. Right. Yeah. So then, and talk about you know him moving his nine year old daughter. I mean, we were teenagers. We were, and I mean, we were. Yeah. I was. I was in seventh grade, I think. I was in the grade. ninth. Yeah. Yeah, ninth grade. So, you know, it that was a that's a really tough time to move because you know yeah. you're you're just you're into your friends, you're into your teammates, if you're playing sports and all that. So coming down here again the fear was what are we even walking into mm -hmm. fortunately for us we were all really good students and we were coming from indiana which at the time was the fifth ranked school system in the country and we didn't know it we didn't know we didn't and know we were we coming were to louisiana which was i don't know say 49th i'm gonna, <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna round it off uh but but we we came down here we did really well in school so right away school was you know something we handled pretty easy and then from an athletic standpoint, we, we actually grew up in a town of a, 100 people. Yeah, I mean, there were between two towns, I think there were 50 people in my class. <laughs> so know? it was a really small really rural area. Yeah. And so kind of like move, Hoosiers, you know. That, yeah, so really. That you move into a big city like yeah, this. Everybody little played every position on every yeah. team. Yeah. Right. That's no right. football. That's right. No football at the school, you know. Not enough people to feel right. the team. Yeah. Yeah, yeah so, so we came from that to – go over to Sherwood uh, Middle or you were at Bel Air. We, we ended La up Bel -Air. Bel Air. You La Bel -Air. went to La Bel Air. Yeah, yeah that was kind of one of the uh, injustices. I started high school in Indiana for a couple months, was in ninth grade, moved down here. Wherever we lived, I was zoned for Sherwood Junior High. I was like, well, no, Demoted. I'm in high school. I'm, a, I'm yeah. in ninth grade. I'm in high. So I went from high school to junior high, and then the next back year high. back to high school at Bel Air. Yeah, so. yeah, I went to Bel Air. <laughs> That's so literally, it's literally it's moving down here. We were like the Clampets. We had uh, uh, our dad had a a, a truck, uh, a pickup truck with rafters, and I mean we had stuff piled yeah. on that, and it was it we're was pig farmers. Like a, you know? Yeah, yeah. Did yeah. y'all bring your pigs down here? Did yeah. not bring Unloaded the pigs them. down. Unloaded them before. And Andy's got a great picture of the farm in his office. I yeah, do. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. We and you know that's that was our thing coming here. Is we always say. Kind of to Bill's comment about moving to Baton Rouge uh, a few years back, we always say, like, you know, how did we get here from, from there? there? When we look at that picture, <laughs> picture yeah. how did we get here from there? And um, and it's uh, it's an interesting story because, like I said earlier, you take that leap. We didn't take it. Our parents took it. But all the things that unfolded in our favor from being in a bigger city versus the little farm town that we were in at the time. Yeah. You know, we would have gone off and done something, but it's there's yeah. so much more opportunity in a bigger city. Tractor we're not accidents, so, who knows? Right. <laughs> we're, not, we're not so certain that they have internet at this point. <laughs> they do have one four way stop still. Yeah. They do. Yeah. Well, look, four way is a big improvement over a two way. Big time, uh, right. 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 no doubt. So, I mean, ex exactly to your point of growing up in a rural community into now being a financial advisor mm. is just two totally different yeah. shifts of the mm -hmm. spectrum. It's not even remotely yeah. close. We didn't even know anybody that had any money when we were growing yeah. up, right? Really? I mean, everybody was farm. Uh, we blue-collar parents, six kids, grew up on a farm. Scarcity was the only talk about money was scarcity and money. Yeah. Yeah. So was it that mentality that drove you to pursue how can we avoid it? I I think subconsciously it's in there. So I've, I've, I've done some some of these little exercises where you try to peel back your story and your motivation. And I, I vividly remember a time when I was running to the bus stop and uh, remember how we had to go down the oh, hill, yeah, yeah. down the gravel hill. When you got to the bottom, well, there was a, it was washed out a little bit. So when it would rain, there'd be puddles, puddles right there. And you yeah. had to jump over the puddle to mm -hmm. keep going to get to the bus stop, to this, get on the bus. It sounds like an uphill in the snow boat. Yeah. 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 It, it really is. So far, it's fairly it's, accurate. I'll let you know that. Yeah, yeah. It, it's like something out of an old movie, right? So anyway, you, you, you jump over the puddle. Well, that particular day, I didn't make it. I landed in the 
somewhat in the puddle and and I didn't realize at the time, but I had the old Chuck Taylor Converse shoes, right? The the white ones. Or we we had red. We had red. red. And um jumped over that. Well, you know, remember the thin rubber on the bottom of those shoes, they would wear out, you know, over time. And apparently mine had worn out and I had a hole in it. So I get on the bus and I'm like, oh man, my socks all soggy and you know. So I go to school, whatever. I, I afterwards, our mom actually taught at the school. So on the way home, uh, I remember telling her when I got home, "Mom, I I need a new pair of shoes. I have I have a hole in my shoe." And uh, she said, "Well, you're you're just gonna have to wait. I got we got to get you know Tom, my brother Tom's shoes or somebody else." And it wasn't goes, me. It wasn't yeah. Andy. <laughs> Andy went barefoot. Um, <laughs> that's the ba- that's the baby proof. Yeah, that's that's right. that was hand me downs. Right, right, right. And as I thought back on that, I. I remember thinking to myself, like, what? Like, yeah. I can't, I, I need yeah. new shoes. And I think that's in there somewhere. I think it's like, you know, I'm not going to live like that when I get grow up and I have a choice in the matter. So it's probably in there motivating me somewhere. Yeah, and that's that's part of the purpose of having that farm because we certainly didn't have much of anything and we grew a lot of the stuff that we consumed. And, uh, and all so, legal. All, right, all legal. Right. Granted, <laughs> granted. All I mean, it legal. sounds like this is back in the seventies <laughs> and eighties. I think the, the the legality of the issues were not at the <laughs> forefront. <laughs> we didn't invite the law. Let's just say it that way. <laughs> we could run a little faster when we heard helicopters. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> but but I think that's part of it. Is you grow up in this in this time where I mean, and I was. I was the bottom of the hand-me-downs, and yeah. so I got those shoes about three years later. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> ah, yeah. Did they come with a warning hole? Yeah. Yeah. Foot will get wet? That's right. right. Exactly. But I think that is a, that's that got to be a part of it because now with what you do interacting with your clients every day is you're ensuring that they don't have to experience that either yeah. with the planning and what you're setting up for them with the longevity of how they can plan themselves financially over the course of their life, it's almost as if you have this passion to not only help yourselves, but to also look at it from your client's perspective and say, look, I don't want you to have to, you know, go back to this farm. Right. Oh, hundred percent. And I, and I look back on the three careers I've, I've been fortunate to be in and each one of those in its own way has kind of been helpful to others, right? You know, the, the broadcasting thing was, Hey, let's let people know what happened today. You know, let's make sure people are informed the healthcare. Obviously that was, you know, you felt really good about helping people when they're at their worst, you know, and now just to, to be helpful for folks to try to figure things out that can be complex, right. Or the unfamiliar and to give them some direction. And I think the planning piece is a big part of that, which is kind of what horizon, you know, we lead with that, you know, everybody should have a plan and it might, you might need to adapt it, uh, adopt and change it as time goes on, but you should have a plan. Or if a pandemic hits. Yeah. 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 Or if a pandemic yeah. hits. Yeah. You have to make the adjustments. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and successful sure. people do tend to do those things. They they tend to seek out advice uh, so that they minimize errors. They make a plan and then they just take action. And that sounds like a very, very simple path to take, mm-hmm. but so very few people are actually able to do it. And you just get in your way. Fear gets in there. Um, procrastination, definitely a big piece of it. So that the formula is kind of simple, you know, to his point, but the execution is, is, is not as easy as it sounds. Yeah. Right. I mean, it can also be a generational issue as well, right? You know, if you're raised in a certain household, your mentality and your thought is not always 20 year looking down the line yeah. it's living you know it's getting the next how, pair of shoes how, how are we gonna get the next yeah. how are we gonna yeah. get the next pair of shoes yeah. for you know little old andy over here yeah <laughs> <laughs> poor little there's, andy there's actually a, a very good book that uh, we all recently read called the psychology of money oh, by morgan book. housel and one of the things he actually says is people's experiences particularly early on in their life tend to frame the way they go about their financial lives in in the future and what kind of risk they take and what kind of risk they don't take. And, yeah. and so, and it's very true. I mean, you look at folks that were born during the great depression or, or raised during the great depression, mm-hmm. you know, and they had uh, parents that stuffed money in coffee cans, literally, right. Uh, because they didn't trust banks, you know, and they yeah. didn't want to put their money there. And so, uh, and they have a very different way of living than someone that was born you know, in the eighties, but there were their parents were experiencing great markets, you know, and, and pretty decent economies. 
Yeah, whatever you were hearing around the kitchen table, dinner right. table, whatever, when you were seven, eight, you know, six, seven, eight years old, that sticks. Yeah. It influences you mm. as you get to grow older. And I'm curious yeah. to see now what children who are raised and specifically from 2020 to 2022 during this pandemic or however long it's going to last, yeah. they're now having the conversations of a whole different mindset. Right. Right? You can plan and look at everything and look at the past and what we project is going to happen but you can still get hit in the face with a curveball mm. that mm. nobody saw coming. Yeah. 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 And, and a, a financial plan is there's a, there's the quote, the financial plan is useless, but the act of doing a financial plan yeah. is priceless because yeah. you're actually collecting where you are now, what you hope to attain down there. And, and there's always going to be something that's going to, you know, come out of left field. That's going to potentially, disrupt you but if you have that plan in place and you know kind of where you want to go you're going to reset you know even yeah. though something comes you're going to be able to reset and say that's still where i want to go right and you that's a big point the vision of yeah. where you're going that that is the piece that has to come first you have to see yourself not so much what do you want to have although that could come into play with goals and whatnot but what do you want to be you know do i want to be a successful business person do I want to be a philanthropist? Do I want to be someone who educates my children about money? And these narratives that you start telling yourself in your head about what do I want to actually be, that drives your behavior and what you read and how you think about money and all those things. So, you know, not not so much the greed side of it, like, man, I want to have the, a, a big car or a place at the beach or this or that. It, those things are fine in and of themselves, but it's really the the, you know, deeper than that as far right. as what drives your behavior mm -hmm. it's, it's driving your <clears throat> for some people it's their longevity of just them and their spouse mm -hmm. for others it's i want to have my generations after me mm -hmm. taken care of Absolutely. right and yeah. some people are fortunate enough to take care of Two. multiple yeah. generations in certain various different ways that they can I think and there's some that thing. can you say look we want to make sure we're good till we're 85 95 years old yeah. And when we run out, we run out, yeah. you know? Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's one of the things, like, when I would be standing there with my soggy sock back in the day, you're not even conceptualizing those types of things. But, you know, we talk to people about, you know, the, the uh, financial version of the airline spiel where you put the oxygen mask on yourself before you help others. Yeah. And I think if you get to a point where you feel like, you know what, I've, we've done well, we're good, now what can I do to – reach down and pull others up and that's to me we see a lot of our clients doing that that's it's one of the things that motivates them and you know how do you use this almost social capital to make their world better make you know a future generation of the family members better and they start thinking beyond themselves once they realize like okay i think i'm going to be pretty good yeah once you achieve like you said you put that oxygen mask on yourself mm -hmm. you become a lot more willing and open-minded to helping other people get their oxygen masks on in a certain way. Perfect. And y'all are doing that in a creative aspect through the medium of audio mm -hmm. via mm -hmm. a podcast. Yeah. So yeah. what kind of brought that about? Because it <laughs> looks like y'all been doing that for a couple of years now mm -hmm. when mm -hmm. podcasting just podcasting in 2022 is just now getting to businesses as a viable marketing plan. Right. Y'all started it way before podcasting was even on businesses thought of something that would be viable. Yeah. Well, uh, that was part of my skill set, you know, just doing the audio and being around the broadcasting thing and then just really trying to figure it out. We, you know, we did feel it's a great way to multiply yourself and multiply your message. Highly shareable. You know, you're opting in, you can subscribe and Hey, I'm getting the next episode right to my phone. Right. We use it a lot in the 401k space as, uh, our podcast is called, inside the plan with the 401k brothers. And so Andy and I are the 401k brothers. We are. We are. <laughs> and, brothers, uh, but not, not twins. twins. Brothers, but not twins. <laughs> and so we use it to, uh, to educate participants. Yeah. You know, we, we do episodes that, you know, contain financial and retirement type topics. A lot in the early episodes, we were talking about the technicals of the some basics, things inside so, yeah. of plans, but yeah. then we started shifting to some more quanti uh, qualitative and behavioral type topics. But 
These are episodes that the plan sponsors of those 401k plans can then filter down to their employees, kind of fulfilling that fiduciary duty of making education. sure the education yeah. piece yeah. is there. You know, so we do that with the 401k plans. We, we do have a Confident Wealth podcast that we do on the wealth management side as well. And then the other thing Horizon does is we actually have affiliated advisors throughout the country. It's called the Horizon Advisor Network. We have a podcast we do there. Not as many episodes, but it's about building your practice as a financial advisor. And so that has its own audience, you know. And so those are the three. And I guess we should say uh, we got another one coming up. We got another one coming we up. We do. So you got about uh, four. It, it's going to be called the Runway Decade pod, podcast. And it's tied in with a book that Pete and I are working on that will be out in May. And so it's kind of geared toward folks in their late 40s, basically the decade of the 50s, kind of that runway to retirement. And so the, some great professionals in their 50s will be interviewing that can bring something of value to others of us folks in our 50s, trying to figure it out, right? Trying to really make some good progress before we do get to retirement. Yeah, I'm, we're excited about that one because it's we, the way we're saying it is it's just people in their 50s talking to other people in their 50s about being in your 50s. Not all financial, but obviously we're advisors, so you know that that trickles in there. Uh, but just a bottom line is that you're in this. Something happens when you cross over fifty. Every decade sort of has its thing, but for whatever reason, anybody you talk to that just turned fifty or is about to turn fifty, all of a sudden it's almost like you peaked over a hill and you can see retirement. Yeah, it's right. still out there, but it's all of a sudden it becomes real. Yeah, yeah, and you start really, really considering it. That's you know, right. In your 20s and your 30s and even your 40s, you're all, we're going to work forever. Yeah. You don't need to worry about this. 20 years from now, we'll still be working. Yeah. You hit 50, you're, oh, there's. There it is. So yeah. The light of the tunnel is now starting to become yeah. visible. Yeah, so, and, and things are happening at the same time. you got kids that are maybe getting out of the house, with exception of Bill. <laughs> <laughs> um, and and then parents that have that have already retired and yeah. are kind of maybe getting to a, a point where they need more care. And so there's, there's things that are happening that really get your thinker going. You know, yeah. there's like, oh. That might be me and, you know, probably going to be there, me. There's some commonality for sure yeah. people that people go through in their 50s. I think the great thing that any podcast does is it kind of shows your authenticity, right? People can experience you and sample mm -hmm. you as a person, as a thinker, without actually having met you yet. But it is a good introduction, you know. So to all those plan participants that maybe might be hesitant to reach out or whatever, or have a question, they can go there and, and maybe get some good education, but also – find a way, okay, well, I like what these guys are saying. Maybe I can get in touch with them, you know, or for potential clients, you know, what are these guys really about? What What is their mindset? How can they help me? And so we hope that's what comes across in those digital platforms, you know. Yeah, and it's, like you said, you're able to give it to the businesses that have people in there mm -hmm. and educate them. And I think that in and of itself, the the long form content that's created via a podcast or what we're doing tonight is a vodcast. Yeah. And you have that element that you can now share with different people so much so that you can put it in your email signature. Right. You know, listen yeah. to our latest show here. Check out our, you know, conglomeration of the four shows we've got going on to get more educated, to learn more. Are you 50? Yeah. Listen to this episode. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. that stuff mm -hmm. is easily shareable across emails, across social channels, and it's yeah. always there forever in time. Yeah. You know, like I said, when I listened to one of y'all's, I think it was the the Horizon, the one that's just more about general stuff. Yeah. yeah. It was y'all were talking about in March of 2020. <laughs> and you look at it as it's a timestamp in someone's life. Yeah. yeah. And how at that point in time, the mindset that was occurring is always saved. Right. You know, it's not lost to kind of a board meeting. It's yeah. frozen in time and yeah. you can always listen to it over and over again. But the stuff that's explicitly educational People can go back to that if they don't know anything of, mm -hmm. of it, and you can start furthering that fiduciary duty. Yeah, and, mm -hmm. and you know, the other great thing, and you guys probably know this, is the, the barriers to entry aren't quite what they used to be for something nope. like this, right? I mean, the equipment, there is a cost there. It's not as expensive as you might think. There is some figuring it out, right? And, you know, I don't know what a RSS feed and all the podcasts, what, you know, 
hosting and all that stuff. We figured it out, you know? And, uh, and so we do have a little studio at the office that we have a podcast, uh, set up. We also have a green screen for some videos we do. We, you know, obviously a lot of people have done a lot of webinars in the last couple of years and, and we've done our share for sure. But, um, it's just kind of one of those things, Hey, w- we need to go on and do something. It's there and set up and ready to go. You know, right. Yeah. It's easily able to create the content yeah. to put out there. You don't have to bring in a team to make yeah. it. Right. Yeah. Well, the shareable thing that you brought up a minute ago is big time. And and it's just the evolution. I mean, we all grew up in the era of the Polaroid camera <laughs> where, you know, the picture comes out, you know, and it's instant. You used to have to go get it developed, right. you know, down at Albertsons or wherever. Now you could shoot the picture out and you could shake it and you could now all of a sudden the picture's coming in. But the only people you could share that with were like in the vicinity, right? Yeah, who could tangibly hold yeah. on to it. And yeah. now you pick up your phone, you boom, you share it out, and thousands, millions, whoever's watching, you know, if you're a celebrity, certainly a lot of people are watching. But it's that is that is the difference between old form, what I would call old form radio, mm-hmm. and this format of podcasting in the sense that they have the little up arrow button with the box on your cell phone, share Patty G show share horizon show and in an instant you know it's to somebody across the country versus somebody just in the vicinity so when bill was getting going i read a quote by seth godin who is a big well-known marketer and he said and this was probably 2012 i would think somewhere around there 2013 Mm. and i said uh and it said um every company today is a media company and and I, I read that, I looked at that, and I was like, we're financial advisors. I mean, we're not a media <laughs> company. I mean, I disagree with this quote. And I sat there and I read it again. Every company is a media company today. And I just kept processing that, and then I realized I got it, right? And, and it's just it's not so much that you're in the media business, but the way that your c- content and your business is consumed today is it makes you into a media company. Right, and the way that you can distribute it, the playing field is almost level yeah. across every single platform, every industry. I can sit with someone and in 10, 15 minutes map out a content strategy that's unique to them that's going to put them on a different level. You know, I think it was two weeks ago we had Galen Iverstein of Iverstein Farms on there. Mm, After the nice. show we talked mm. about, look, you need to get a camera in the back shop. You need to start filming people huh. making those cuts. That's a great you need to start filming yeah. all the cleaning, all the deliveries that you're making. All that is beautiful content, and it's unique to your company, right? Yeah. The Bush Brothers are unique to Horizon. Creating content around that is huge that nobody can replicate. Yeah, They can maybe mimic or try and copy and paste, but it's still unique to the three of you. Yeah, 100%. And that's how many thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, of podcasts and shows are out there that could be talking about similar topics, but you have the unique host, the unique hostess that are bringing this content to life, the unique business owner. Everyone's story is unique. You know, that's the beauty of this show is showcasing people in Baton Rouge and Louisiana with their, all of their unique stories. Yeah. We're episode, I think, 107 right now with y'all. Mm. No story has been the same. Wow. We've yeah. crossed over industries, but every story is different, and every company has the ability like I was telling y'all, my first three, two shows were on an iPhone 8. Yeah. Mm-hmm. The excuse of lack of equipment is gone. It's 100%. Right. I, I was about to say, I gave a presentation for a group of advisors last summer and just, you know, we, I told them what the equipment we had and, you know, kind of the low barrier to entry, but really it's everybody's got a studio in their pocket now. You know, uh, and like you said, the iPhone 8, yeah, perfect. You know, I'm recording, I can record a podcast, send it on its way. And uh, do videos and, and all that. It's it's right there now. With with certain hosting platforms, we use Anchor, and Anchor has the ability on your phone to record it straight onto the platform in, in clips. Mm. So I can go yeah. and have interviews at a live event, yeah. put all those clips together automatically, press publish, and they're going to distribute it to all the different mediums. Mm. And it's going to be out there for all for everyone to hear. I mean, eventually you can upgrade to, the, you know, the full eye focus studio quality where we've got, you know, some sure SMB7s. We've got some great Canon cameras sure. over here, and we've got the big light. But you don't need that from a business's standpoint no, to get right. started. Yeah. You and, learn along the way. And you don't have to be the expert either. I mean, you, you don't. know, the, the, the who, not how, you know, in the true who, not how fashion is there is a who for everything. 
you know, and it's just finding that person, seeking them out. Cause you know, you're going to have business owners that sit there and go, I don't even want to learn all that stuff, I did, but I would show up and talk. And that's mm-hmm. kind of more me and Bill really is and more me. his thing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm more of a show up and talk. Yeah. You show up for the pretty face. Ah, yeah. A radio face, right? That's right. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> yeah. That is one downside. You have people have to see our face. Yeah, yeah. that's right. We could hide on radio. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, it's exactly that. The business owners don't necessarily need to know all of this gear. They don't need to be like Jacob yeah. sitting over there with the board, controlling yeah. the volume, controlling yeah. the camera angles. But if they know someone who can do that and they can show up, and do their craft for someone to capture, yeah. that is more powerful than them spending the time learning how to do everything themselves and then starting it. If they can call up and say, yeah. hey, Patty, I want to get on the show. I want to record an episode. Let's let's sit down and talk. Right. It's so much easier than, all right, I need to spend 40, 80, 100 hours researching <laughs> what in the world an RSS yeah. feed is, yeah, yeah. how it works, and then creating something. Yeah. Well, and, and if you don't know these days and you want to do it on your phone, just give your phone to a 12-year-old and they'll be glad to show you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they'll, no. they'll be glad to show you and show you a whole lot quicker yeah, right, than right. you could ever imagine. Exactly. Totally. Yeah. So y'all have worked together a while as brothers, and you know it's, it's relatable to me because I grew up with my brothers and we all had a lawn care business together. Right. Mm-hmm. And then we split off and did our own things. One's an attorney, one's now a master plumber, mm-hmm. and nice. now I'm a CPA. So we're all in different areas and different um, avenues, but working together, you learn different things along the way. Mm-hmm. And so kind of from each of you, what are some three lessons y'all have gathered throughout not only family business, but being an entrepreneur as a whole? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. We'll go youngest. We'll, we'll go youngest to old. No, 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 not yeah. from one another. Just in general. Uh, Three lessons you've learned along your journey of business. I think you should go oldest first. All right, yeah. oldest, yeah. oldest, I'll oldest, oldest to youngest. To think. I'll be glad to go first. Uh, <laughs> I think it is uh, the first thing is is you know be coachable and actually seek out coaching. You know, and I think uh, when Pete founded this business, you know he s- sought that out. He Pete's in strategic coach, and so a lot of processes that horizon uses are born out of that but also he was a great benefactor of having played for skip burtman who was a great master motivator and a great coach he filters that down as a coach for our uh, company in a great way so i think it is that you know if you're an entrepreneur be coachable but also seek out coaching yeah well and i would add to that that's very true and what goes along with that the glue that ties that together which is a little cliche now, but it is the glue is getting everyone to see that business through the same lens. Cause if you start putting different people together, a lot of, a lot of people in our industry, a lot of CPAs, they'll start out as the solo guy, you know, hang out their shingle. They start attracting clients. And then, like you said, they got to start getting help. And the minute they hire that first person, you now have another person that's showing up to your office every day that that sees the business a little different than you for sure unless you show them what the lens is right so we do i think a, as good a job as anybody of and again i got this from skip right and uh it's it's having how did he get a bunch of you know 18 to 21 22 year olds to see through the same lens at what that team was trying to accomplish so I just take that into what we're doing now and make sure we don't have, you know, 10 different versions of horizon. There's one horizon. Matter of fact, we, uh, we have a thing in internally, a document that's called one horizon, right? (laughs) And it's, and it's basically a list of, uh, all kinds of different things, but it's, it's basically saying, this is who we are here. This is our culture. This is what we believe this. And if you don't believe that, that's fine. You know, cause if you fake, like you believe it, it eventually it'll spit you out you know, it, whether you spit yourself out or it spits you out. But so I, I say the vision is the number one thing because, you know, Skip, uh, he, he did a couple of quotes over and over and over. I had four years with him at LSU. And the number one thing, and I still write it in my journal, it's the very first thing I write on January 1st when I'm doing the new journal. Andy knows it. Yeah. If it is to be, it's up to me. And that was in our locker room, you know. And the second thing was, Anything you vividly imagine, ardently desire, enthusiastically act upon must, must come to pass, right? So 
that vision of what you're trying to accomplish, getting others to see that what's in your head is very difficult without you somehow or another getting it out of your head and onto paper in a format that others can digest it. Cause you just talking about it, it it's just words in the air. You have to focus people on it. And so mm. being an entrepreneur, I would say, um, there are people that will come to work for you. They're all there for their own reason. So they're not there for your reason. You have to make the vision capable where capable of them seeing themselves in the picture. So if you come to work somewhere and you don't see yourself in the picture five years from now, you're just going to show up and cash your check and do your work and you're a nice employee, stay out of trouble. But if you come to work and you buy into what's happening there and you see the vision and you see yourself like, man, I can grow with this firm. I can actually be what I want to be, right? What I want to be here mm -hmm. and I can see it happening here. Well, that's the job of the leader to paint that picture that you can follow. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. That's good. Both of you guys had excellent. <laughs> and you've had plenty of time. I've had plenty of time with Let's your see what answer. Andy came and are y'all ready? On the spur of the moment. Uh, no, I think it kind of goes right along yeah. with that. So, so being coachable, having a vision, and then being a team player in the sense of uh, everybody's got their own unique gifts and abilities, and uh, and show appreciation and gratitude towards others mm. for that. You don't, uh, you know, you're not going to see a, a, a pitcher turn to a shortstop and tell him how to play his, his position. Right. Yeah. Let, let each person play their position and come together as a team coherently so that a lot of stuff can get done a lot quicker. If, you know, for me, I think one thing that I've had to learn is to let go of stuff. I try to control too much. And <laughs> so for me, allowing staff to help out and allowing uh, others you know, in, in our group, uh, uh, take over something when they're probably the best person, best player on the field to do that. Uh, mm -hmm. and then, and then, like I said, showing appreciation and gratitude. I think mm -hmm. those Big two time. things are massive in any, in any relationship, you know, uh, that's, very, that's very good. Good answer. That's what good answer. That was good. You did, you did good. Oh, you did good. Uh, <laughs> so what is something that you did as a kid, you wish you could still do today? Oh, great mm. question. Oh, shimmy board, huh, Bill? Great <laughs> question. Uh, I, I know my, mine's easy, playing baseball. Yeah. yeah. Like, I got, I, I don't know what it was, but throwing a baseball and hitting a baseball made me feel better about myself. Like, it was something I was good at and I could do. And so, yeah, I would go back and do that all day long with my brothers. Ooh, there you right. go. Yeah. You do in the office. We, and we actually did that for a little while. We did do that for a little while. <laughs> yeah, and so, it hurt. So it was interesting growing up, uh, I never got to play with those guys because of the age gap. I was yeah. uh, four years behind Pete, five years behind Bill, and so we never were on the same teams growing up. But when – Later in life. Later in life. And I was maybe early 30s, and they were later 30s. We all played on one of these adult baseball teams with our brother Tom – Great time. for a year it was a great summer until Tom pulled his hammy. Tom, yeah, yeah, <laughs> came up, yeah. We all pulled something, but hey, <laughs> we all did pull something. But all of us went yard that same year, and yeah. I was the last. <laughs> yeah, to go yard. yeah. Uh, so I, I I came back from uh, from some vacation. I had missed a few games, and Tom Tom went yard. I was like, what? Yeah, and he was like, you're the Left only you. one. And my first at bat, you went, weren't going down without nice. a fight. Nice. Um, but is that what you would do from when you were younger? Hit home runs. No, or just no. <laughs> play ball because you were 30 when that happened but. yeah right 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 that was a long time ago what would i do i, I you know I, I i don't know i was in my own little world a yeah. lot of times patch so. holes in your yeah. shoes yeah, yeah i would patch i would we didn't duct see tape. Andy much i would just use duct tape a lot more andy oh. was we always joke about this because there's six kids in the family and andy is the youngest and we always joke that this was us anywhere we were out going to out to eat or to a park or whatever this was us right and then Andy, would, come on, Andy, come on, right? And then, then you separate out the. Andy you had Andy, uh, come on, he somebody was grab Andy. And I think a lot of that still happens. <laughs> <laughs> never, never goes away. That's right. Uh, that's right. Hmm. Yeah. So for me, I think it would be shampoo my hair. 
Uh, you miss it. Yeah, yeah you just miss right, it. Yeah. No, it would it would probably be playing ball. I mean, it was such a big part of us growing up, yeah, and yeah, and I think uh, one of the neat things we did we we did have tobacco on our farm, so we raised tobacco, and there's tobacco sticks. And one of the reasons I think we got pretty accomplished as hitters was we would go on the driveway, throw up a piece of gravel, and hit it with a tobacco right. stick. Well, tobacco sticks about that. Thin, you a piece know? of gravel is about that. Yeah, yeah. so yeah. I mean, you had that. You hand really developed that good hand-eye coordination. That was just a little farm game we played that probably ended up, you know, doing yeah. pretty well by. And us. the original batting gloves were like those big, thick farmer's <laughs> gloves, yeah. you know, so you didn't get splinters. Yeah, <laughs> you know. But yeah, we had some good adventures on the farm, so I would definitely like to go back and do some of that stuff. Yeah. Be young enough. That, to, that was to an eight-year period stuff. of our life, and we were, you know, I was. Five yeah. when we moved there, and maybe thirteen when we left, and yeah. it's just some formative years, you yeah, know, right. what you learn and see, and and a farm, you know, we worked, you know, we worked, we had animals, wow. we well, Andy, <laughs> Andy, much, Andy was come on, Andy, we're working, let's go, <laughs> uh, but we fed the, fed the animals, and you know, worked in the, uh, tobacco, corn, drove tractors, and we were like yeah. eight or nine years old, we're plowing fields, you know, so some of that work ethic came out in that little chapter. And uh, and just some really fun times because yeah. you know the seventies were a cool time to be growing up too, right? Yeah. So what do y'all love about Baton Rouge? Mm. Ooh, the people. Yeah, the people here are amazing. They really are. They're, you know, it's uh, I, I I think it's Baton Rouge's number one maybe untapped resource because it's, you can travel pretty much to anywhere, and you know you run into you run into good people it's a everywhere. Big, small town. Yeah, but the, mm -hmm. there's something special about this community. The the people are different here than when you go to a a city. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Nobody's ever said the new bridge when you answer that question. <laughs> that question uh, uh, no, no one has yeah, ever. Well, there's been no mentions of traffic. <laughs> right, right, right. Uh, oh, the bridge, yeah, yeah. light well, cycles. Right. None of that. I, you None know. Of that. New Orleans gets a lot of play on the food thing, right? But I can appreciate the Baton Rouge food scene just having come from the middle part of the state where, let's face it, the offerings were a little more sparse, <laughs> right? Uh, but so I, that's one of the things I really enjoy being back, you know, is, is having a lot of choices, right? Yeah. To go and enjoy drinking, eating, whatever, you know, entertainment. Yeah. If you travel enough to big cities, you you come to appreciate what you have in Baton Rouge, and it is it's LSU. It's mm -hmm. you know that that community of uh, uh, rallying around this this uh, college and the sports, are particularly uh, there. And uh, and I think it's it is just it's it's a big small town. You run like Pete said, you run into people that were like, hey, I know you from somewhere. Where yeah. we get let's go back and and they you know grew up three blocks away from you they went to middle school with you or something yeah. like that or went with your brothers and so it's it, you make connections really easily and yet you always have people you how have we been in the same town for yeah no, 30 years other, yeah. and right, right. never run across I, it, yeah. I do it i did appreciate when i first moved back here was the fact that you know on it's during baseball season it's it's tuesday or wednesday night i can go out get off of work and go see the lsu tigers play you know oh, baseball yeah. that's awesome man yeah. so yeah those little things man they they mean a lot Absolutely. And yeah. for the, the final question is, what can I do to help you? Hmm. Mm. Keep doing your thing, man. I really yeah, enjoyed yeah. watching your shows, uh, the, bringing people on and digging into their stories a little bit. I've enjoyed going back and looking at some of those. Some of them, like I, I had told you before, are people we know, mm -hmm. you know, that we've worked with for a long time. So it's uh, it's a it, it's conversations you get into into with them that we don't get into with them. You know, so it's almost yeah. like you get get to know a person from a different angle when we hear them on your show. And yeah, just man, keep being a good dude in the community. Yeah. This this city's great and it just needs good people like you to keep doing your thing. Yeah, I think that's it. Everybody's got a story, you know, and, and you're helping people tell their story. So keep doing that. You know, yeah. that's a lot of value in that. Yeah. Well, I don't. I don't intend on stopping. There you yeah. go. Yeah, At least yeah. for the next six months, right? Making right. Baton Rouge better one interview at a time. That's right. Yeah. That's right. That's you. Man, I should have should have called you for the tagline. Yeah. <laughs> we're cre we're analytical, but we're creative. Yeah. So. Yeah. There's we always a, a creative we side a to an analytical person. Totally. Yeah. yeah. I gave a speech on that to a bunch of financial advisors and you know, uh about most of them do consider themselves, you know academics and analytical and all that and i proved to them from the stage which is a long story that they're really all creative they just ignore that part of themselves you know yeah it's mm. it's pushed away so you can 
focused on that craft mm-hmm. of providing the best service, the best, you know, technical expertise that you can provide to the client. Right. Yeah. One of, one of the things I said, just to keep it short, was, you know, raise your hand if you're married. Guys, just the guys on this one, raise your hand if you're married. And, of course, they raised their hand. And I was like, you're creative, trust me. Because for <laughs> any of you guys to actually convince somebody to marry you, <laughs> you had to come up with some good stuff. Uh, yeah. You had to get creative. You had to get creative. Yeah. Well, thank you all, Bush Brothers. Oh, you bet. Hey, thank you, show. man. Patty Enjoy. G is awesome. Yeah. I appreciate the time and appreciate y'all, you know, your story and where y'all came from. I learned a lot, and I want to thank y'all so very much. Yeah, yeah, yeah thank man. you, man. Appreciate so, it. Awesome. And uh, thank everybody else for tuning in, whether you're listening to us or you're watching us. I appreciate you. I know the guests do as well. You are the reason the show is going where the show is going, and we are able to get there by sharing and commenting and liking the show, subscribing to the podcast whatever platform you listen to. Also, leaving us a review and rating us. You can rate us on Spotify. You can rate us on iTunes. Wherever you listen, be sure and let us know you're listening, and we'll reach out to you and kind of interact with you as best as we can. And thank you all so very much for tuning in. Thank you so much to Falaya Focus Studios for allowing us the ability to film and record in here. They take it up to a whole new level Mm -hmm. that a lot of people in this town haven't seen. If you're interested in starting a show, starting a podcast for your business, reach out to Barrett, reach out to the show. I'll put you in touch with them and make sure that we can make something happen. And also to Government Taco for our wonderful sponsoring of this show. They have new tacos every month. This month is a sweet taco for Valentine's, and it is called the Ponch Train. It's a dessert taco. If you're into tacos and you're around the Jefferson government area, be sure to check them out. And tell them that the Patty G Show sent you. And also to these three lovely gentlemen, the Bush brothers <laughs> with Horizon. We get that a lot. Lovely. They've, lovely. lovely. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Always lovely. <laughs> They've got a wonderful network of podcasts on their website. Be sure to go check that out. If you're interested in any of the services they provide, be sure to reach out to them as well and let them know that you heard from them on the Patty G Show. And we're going to go and hear a listen of a message from Horizon right after this and y'all thank y'all so very much and be sure and check out horizon and share their shows as well i'm patty g host the patty g show thank y'all at horizon financial group we enjoy helping others achieve greater confidence clarity and direction in their lives we realize everyone's path to financial success is unique sometimes you just need a friendly guide along the way Whether it's customized financial planning, individual wealth management, or servicing your company's retirement plan, we've got the team with the experience to help you reach your goals. Horizon Financial Group, helping you provide, protect, and prosper for those counting on you. Visit us at horizonfg.com. Satera Advisors, LLC. Member FINRA SIPC. Satera is a separate entity.